Hello, welcome. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Dorothea Zivkovic, the uh, chair of the curriculum committee, and Mary Alice Calm, the chair of the faculty development committee for sponsoring this workshop. Uh, my name is Michael Berger. I'm an associate professor of English and communications here at the Christ College of Nursing and Health Sciences. And so knowing what was coming down the road here in terms of having to do online teaching, I accepted the invitation to attend this workshop uh, last summer in Madison. Um, and I also have uh, enrolled as a, a, an online student myself. So for the past eight weeks uh, of the semester, I was a, an undergraduate student at the uh, Southern New Hampshire University, enrolled in a, in a course on, on uh, popular and contemporary literature taught by a uh, professor somewhere on the West Coast. I don't know where. So I was a virtual student just to have that experience from the student's perspective. Um, and and uh, my professor in that course uh, identified this particular workshop, this conference, as, as a, uh, in her words, a robust center of research in this field. Um, it was a big conference, and there was a lot of information there. I would recommend it for, for our people going forward. The conference uh, is practical. It's intended to bring research into practice um, and to meet the needs of a wide array of stakeholders in, in online learning, including educators and administrators and course designers. There was a, there was a bunch of stuff for everybody. Uh, over a thousand conference participants, over 150 uh, events, and, and some uh, vendors and sponsors. Um, so it was a big event, it was well organized, I would, I would recommend it. Um, coming out of that event, uh, I, I gathered a lot of information, and there's more to, more to talk about than what I'm going to present here, but I've identified some key themes that I will talk about, and then we can see how we might be able to um, implement some of these ideas uh, in what we're doing now and going forward. So I want to talk about pedagogy and, and distance learning theory. I want to talk about the hybrid model of learning, um, the, the problem of persistence, because um, persistence is a problem in higher ed education generally, and, but particularly in, in online education. Talk a little bit about group work and some miscellaneous tips. The first uh, workshop that I attended was, it was a full morning. This, at, at this conference there were workshops, as I said, uh, targeted to all kinds of audiences, but uh, also uh, of different uh, time spans. This was a full morning workshop that I attended, the first morning with Ed Bowen, who is a, uh, a lead course designer or director at a community college system in Dallas. Um, and so the focus was, was pedagogy and technology. And so, so uh, one of Ed's uh, fundamental principles that he wanted to convey to us was that um, it's important to start with outcomes. What do you want the students to get out of the course? Which we're very focused on that, and, and so we know that. Um, a lot of people from other institutions have, have trouble wrapping their minds around that. You know, they, they think, here's the content I want to convey, and that's sort of what I focus on. So he says, focus on outcomes first, and then view the, the technology through the lens of what you want to accomplish, what you want your students to be able to do. What do you want them to, to look like? What do you want them to be able to do? What does critical thinking mean in your area? And, and, and what activities can you design, and how can the technology help those activities to foster that, those, those key outcomes that you really want to shoot for? So he says to think about pedagogy as the activities that achieve the outcomes. And he, he told, told us about this, this two sigma problem that I had not heard of before by a, a prominent researcher named Benjamin Bloom, which showed that uh, depending on the, on the mode and, and follow through of the instruction, learning uh, increases by one to two standard deviations by moving from showing students to showing and having them practice, and then to showing and having them practice and having them show someone else. He says the, the, the third stage gives you a, a, a two sigma 
uh, change in, I don't know, the statistical language, but it's this two, uh, two sigma standard deviation change. Um, and, and that's equivalent to lecturing and lecturing with some activities for mastery and then individual tutoring. And so his, his, his challenge to us is how can our technology push toward individual tutoring to get those, those, those radical increases in learning. He also talked about motivation. So motivation, how do we keep the students motivated? Um, motivation consisting of autonomy, um, a, a feeling of mastery, and a sense of purpose. And uh, this was, I thought, a very interesting slide here. So st these are some, some activities that um, reinforce and, and, and foster motivation. So I'll just give you a chance to look at this slide for a bit and browse through, through those. Very stimulating food for thought there, I think. A big um, theory, concept, that was all over the place at this conference, I heard everywhere, was, was the, the, the three presences. The community of inquiry that, that is anchored in three presences. This, this theory uh, is, is, um, uh, pervades uh, discussions of online learning. So the three presences, social presence, teaching presence, and cognitive presence. So some definitions. Social presence is defined as the ability of participants to identify with the community, communicate purposefully in a trusting environment, and develop interpersonal relationships by way of projecting their individual personalities. So it's about um, connection and communication and, and, and confidence to, to relate interpersonally. Social presence. Teaching presence, the design, facilitation, and direction of cognitive and social processes for the purpose of realizing personally meaningful and educationally worthwhile learning outcomes. And one of the things that faculty need to, to know uh, up front and to really focus on and, and, and pre prepare themselves to devote a lot of energy to is the fact that online teaching requires a lot of facilitation, a lot of facilitation. Um, both, you know, keeping people using the technology and the course and, 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 the, and the web design appropriately, successfully, and, and also the, the actual teaching, the leading of the students cognitively. So social presence, teaching presence, and cognitive presence. Um, constructing and confirming meaning through sustained reflection and discourse. So that, that's, a, that's a, a, a theoretical construct, a, a framework for thinking about what we're doing with, with designing and implementing online courses. And um, let me show you a model. So there you can see, um, you got um, social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. And then you can see how with the Venn diagram, various activities are, um, are within each of those approaches and, and they overlap. So this is kind of a neat way to think about it, I think. And, and so you think about those ideas of, of the different, the three presences, and then you also think about supporting discourse, setting the climate, selecting content. Kind of a neat, a neat model for thinking about how to, how to put it all together and make it happen. And so the recommendation in, in uh, the common wisdom in, in online learning is to lead with social presence. Develop your sense of community. Um, and in the opening days of an online course, establish those personal connections and that sense of community. Personal introductions. In my online course that I took, there, was a, there, there were uh, several discussion boards throughout the eight weeks you know, each devoted to a component of the course, but the first discussion board was an icebreaker, and it was and it was it was presented as being very informal. People just you know shared who they are, what they what they're about in their personal life, how this course fits into their 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 whole life, and you know 
you know, people talked about how many pets they had and, and activities and hobbies and stuff. So it's, it's intended to generate that, that sense of, of uh, community, including the instructor. It's highly recommended that the instructor present him or herself in this way also. Very, very human and very, you know, like you guys. I'm, I'm like you guys. I'm facilitating the learning experience, but for this online mode to work, it's not like, you know, I'm the professor and you approach me. It's very personal. In fact, um, one presenter showed us a, a video of uh, an instructor introducing herself for an online course. And the video consisted of mostly looking at her daughter, who was about, I don't know, five or six or so. And, 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 and the, the instructor, at first, off camera, prompting the, the child with questions uh, intended to elicit information about the instructor from, the, from her daughter's point of view. You know, what do I like to do? Well, you know, what, is it, what, 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 what do you see when mommy's at work? And, and stuff like that. Um, and so it was very, it was very engaging and, and, and affecting. Um, so that's, that's, you know, maybe more personal than we're used to, to being, but it, it, that's a recommendation. So some things we know about, uh, about online learners, and a lot of online learners are adult learners. So things that we know about, about both of those are that adult learners are more self-directed, and they want application. Um, and that, that online, successful online learners have self-confidence, and this is in a general sense, and what's called self-efficacy, which means a specific aptitude in, the, in a particular situation and an internal locus of control. And I think that, that correlates very well with our ex experience so far. I think we, we recognize that people who have these qualities um, tend to succeed and, and others struggle with online learning. Um, this was, this was an, an interesting um, idea that came out in one presentation. The um, satisfaction dissatisfaction continuum. So, in terms of evaluating an online learning experience, we tend to think of satisfaction and dissatisfaction as being on the same continuum, right? Satisfaction is good at one end, dissatisfaction is good on the other end. So, this work by Hertzberg um, was conducted within a corporate setting, but, but online learning people have adopted it and applied it. And so the idea is that, in fact, satisfaction and dissatisfaction are discontinuous. They are not on the same continuum. So, so if, if workers are dissatisfied about something and you, you remedy that, that doesn't lead to satisfaction. That leads to the dissatisfaction going away, but that doesn't guarantee satisfaction as if they're on the same continuum. Satisfiers Factors that lead to satisfaction relate to the work itself, and dissatisfiers relate to the context or the environment. So they talk about environmental hygiene. Having a nice, clean course system um, it, it solves any dissatisfactions, but it doesn't lead to satisfaction. And so um, there's the importance of course design um, thinking about dissatisfaction versus satisfaction. And then in terms of evaluating, you want to be careful that you have um, two different evaluation instruments or in your evaluation instrument um, segregating clearly dissatisfiers and satisfiers. So that you're not confusing matters by, knowing, by, by assuming that if you if you relieve dissatisfaction, that leads to satisfaction. You have to measure them on different continua. Does that make sense? So then another concept was the five moments of learning need from uh, somebody named Gottfriedson. So these are, the, these are the moments when we need something to, to foster our learning. When we're learning for the first time, when we're wanting to learn more, when we try to remember, when things change, and when something goes wrong. And those three that are asterisked, those are uh, recommended, uh, um, those are moments where um, 
mobile technology is recommended as being useful. So this presentation had to do with mobile technology and pushing things out through phones. Um, I had some, some misgivings about that. One of the things that we know about uh, phone users is that they, um, they, the average uh, phone, smartphone user reaches for their device 150 times a day. So I'm thinking, you know, and we see, we see students in class who are reaching for their devo devices, right? And I'm thinking, um, attention span is an issue. You know, the ability to do deep reading and to concentrate and to think for long, uninterrupted periods of time is an issue. Do we want to be um, adding to that 150 times with more opportunities for them to reach for their mobile devices? To her credit, the person that was doing this presentation um, indicated that, you know, some of those moments, it's, it's not necessarily appropriate, like these first two, learning the first time and, and wanting to learn more. But follow through after class when you want to push something out um, that's a that's a follow-up to, to, to what went on in class or when when uh, students aren't sure about the chronology of due dates and so on and so forth um, those are those are moments when it would be appropriate and useful to use you know the latest smartphone technology to push information out to students <clears throat> The hybrid model is celebrated by a lot of people as being a very powerful learning model. The flipped classroom that a lot of people are talking about these days is the hybrid model, where, um, where you have some things happening um, in person, face to face, and some things happening online. Um, and so hybrid doesn't just mean using an online learning system a lot, it means reduce seat time. So the, 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 there are fewer face-to-face um, -face class sessions. So in order to take advantage of the power of the hybrid and to, and to make it, it work effectively and to reduce dissatisfaction and enhance satisfaction, some things to keep in mind, streamline content. So there's what's called the time and a half syndrome where you, you think, okay, now I'm, 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 I'm going hybrid. I've got all these online opportunities to enhance what I'm doing. So I'm going to do everything that I normally do face to face and just add a lot of stuff online. That's too burdensome. And the goal is, is, is not just to alternate the modalities and do what's good in this modality here and do what's good in this modality here, but to really think about how to integrate those modalities and have a symbiosis between them. And the hybrid model also is, is celebrated as, as being harmonious with the shift from teacher-centered to student-centered learning. So you're, you're, you're making them do a lot of activities, engaging with the, with the material. So one of the advantages, one of the powers of it is that you can make students engage with content before the class meeting. You know, we've all had the experience of telling students to come prepared by reading something before class or, you know, doing something before class, and, you know, some of them don't do it. And so the, the activities in class suffer. So um, you, can, you can ensure engagement by having them do uh, assessments online or discussion boards online in advance. And that, that's, that's leveraging the, the, the modalities to have a symbiotic effect with each other so that when they come to class they are much more prepared and ready to do the activities in the class that carries the learning forward with that material. <coughs> to keep in mind with hybrid you will probably cover less content and it will require more instructor time. But it's a, it's a powerful modality. So the hybrid flow of engagement goes from content, you present the content, students interact with the content, students interact with each other, and then students interact with the instructor. With hybrid, it's recommended that you meet with students face-to-face um, -face for the first few classes to establish social presence and to instill comfort with what needs to be done online. 
Um, it's recommended for in undergraduate classes to decrease the time span of classes. So like instead of three hour classes, one and a half hour classes, meeting more frequently and to chunk the learning um, and, and to chunk the activities that integrate the learning, more chunking, little bits more frequently. Um, it's said that, that successful teachers in, in the hybrid mode use no more than five technologies and it's recommended to post models of good work from previous classes, which is, all, I think, a, you know, a, a very sound pedagogical principle anyway. So the key questions to ask if you're doing hybrid, what are your outcomes? What do you want them to accomplish? What activities will help them to accomplish that? How do you integrate the work done outside the classroom, perhaps even in the community? This, this lends itself a, a lot, I think, to service learning. Um, and what are the demographics of your class? Do you have a lot of experienced um, adult learners with an internal locus of control or, or not? Do you have a lot of freshmen straight out of high school? Um, adjust accordingly. <clears throat> what activities are appropriate for different kinds of content? It doesn't have to be the same thing all the time, depending on the content. And how will you divide the, the modalities at, at Marquette, where the, the person who, who gave a lot of this information comes from, they do more than 50% in class. Our hybrid is going to be a lot less than 50% in class, but that's something that you know each instructor, each program, each school has to decide. And how will you evaluate each component of the class? And of course, quality matters will play a big role there. So another common theme was persistence. How do, we, how do we keep online learners engaged and successful and persisting through the program? Um, variables include background, work and family life, um, their academic skills, and, and their psychology, their local self-control, their maturity and readiness. And again, these, these attributes that I mentioned before, self-confidence, self-efficacy, and the internal locus of control. So we can help with self-efficacy. We can help with students um, gaining a, a sense of confidence that in this particular course they can, be, they can be efficacious, they can be effective and successful by building in successes um, and, and, and thinking vertically through the curriculum. The initial courses, online or hybrid courses that we offer to, to students may be a little leaner in, in, in course content to give them a chance to experience success in this modality. Um, and then you increase the challenge and the substance as, as, as they go along. Uh, lots, of, lots of motivational feedback, show appreciation for what they're going through, and, and, and there the establishment of of social presence from, from the teacher at the beginning uh, in, in an informal way. I'm like you, I know what you're going through. That will facilitate this kind of, of fostering of self-efficacy and a lot of feedback. And, and, and the, the need for continuous feedback is one reason why online learning is, is challenging for teachers in terms of workload. So they talk about cognitive load. So in terms of persistence, um, being able to handle the cognitive load is, is important. Um, cognitive load is defined as load on working memory during learning. And, and um, there are intrinsic factors that bear on that. What are the learning materials like? How challenging are they intrinsically? And extraneous factors that bear on that, um, sort of the environmental hygiene aspect of it, are the materials organized in a way that is, is user friendly. So to help with cognitive load, um, to ensure that students persist and feel self-efficacy, um, limit the amount of material, simplify the structure of the content, and give clear and detailed instructions for how to use the content. So that's a lot of upfront loading, too, that happens with online learning. Um, it's not just, oh, I have these great activities, I have this, this course design, I have this flow, but you have to think about how am I going to ensure that the students understand what to do and, and feel, feel uh, clear and confident about it. So there's a lot of that instructional stuff that has to be worked out in advance. So the kinds of, of scaffolding that we, can, that we can apply to help um, with cognitive load. 
procedural, metacognitive, conceptual, and strategic. So procedural, um, give them uh, uh, clear orientations, give them checklists, give them resource tools as they go along to keep them on track. Procedural scaffolding, metacognitive scaffolding. Um, help them plan and establish goals for their learning as they go along. Um, and help them uh, to think about not only the course, but to think about how they're managing their learning in this, in this environment. Um, give them roadmaps, content reviews, and chunk. This was a big theme, chunk. Chunk material in small packages so that it's easy to comprehend and they can progress smoothly through the course material. Um, I don't remember specific examples of chunking, but I think we can all probably think about how we could take what we do naturally in a unit, in, an, in a in a face-to-face -face course that we're used to, and and think about if if you got the students engaging with that uh, that material online, how could you divvy it up more so that there's absorption of of content or activity um, in smaller chunks. And, and, it, and, and so there, there can also be a rhythm um, between the engagement with the content and the application through activity. And you, and you intersperse more frequently those engagement activities to reinforce with, with shorter, smaller quantities of content. Conceptual scaffolding. Give students headings, annotate texts, again, concept maps, graphic organizers for historical content, timelines. Give them frameworks to help them organize the concepts. More important with online learning than it is with with face-to-face. -face. With face-to-face, -face, you can be right there, and when they're not clear, they can ask you and you can explain. Um, and that can happen too, like with emails or discussion boards, but it's more, it's, it's more mediated there. And so more help up front to ensure that the students can find their way through material. And strategic scaffolding, tailor uh, individual instruction as much as possible as you get to know your students and have frequent dialogue. So these, these kinds of scaffolding to help with cognitive load, to help with self-efficacy, and ultimately to foster persistence through the program to help students be successful and persist. Um, and again, uh, finally, for fostering persistence just in time support, um, give them what they need in terms of the support when they need it and try to anticipate when they'll need it so that you can give it to them and if they call for it, <laughs> respond immediately and give them what they need. And so the syllabus becomes something that we're used to looking at as a whole and presenting at the beginning of the class and leading them through the class in a face-to-face -face situation. When you have an online component, whether it's hybrid or totally online, you also chunk the syllabus and you divvy it up into modules. And our tier one consultants are talking to us about that, thinking, thinking from, sh shifting our thinking from, on the syllabus from units to modules um, and more chunking. And, and the presentation of the module just in time, like you know, with the syllabus, you, again, you present it at the beginning of the class and you lead them through, you can remind them as you go along but it's like they've got this whole thing in advance. You give them the whole thing in advance in an online setting, but you also chunk it and you can deliver it to them, remind them in, in, in smaller units. Here's what we're doing now. Here's a, a fresh presentation of, of that process and that content online for you now to engage with. There was, there was a lot of talk about group work, um, and, and group work lends itself to problem-based learning, which is um, uh, a focus of our uh, BSN programs coming online. So with group work, you're trying, you, you have to try to develop uh, self-directed learning, and, and, and you, ha you should assume that they need some training to, to, to be active learners. 
Um, transparency is, is important, so you're, you're telling everybody everything all at the same time, not just sort of having, um, you know, offline conversations with, with particular students, but, but, but everything to everybody all the time, except in emergency situations, you can deal with people individually offline. If you're going to establish teams, probably a good idea to establish them randomly, and once they're established, it, it's, uh, it's hard to change them. It becomes a logistical nightmare to change them. Teams, once you establish them, you should have the students establish within their team functional roles, who's the mediator, who's the record keeper, and so on, so that they're set up for you know, effective teamwork and, and not just sort of flailing around and figuring out how to do it as they go along. With group work, um, the instructor can facilitate by posting weekly agendas and, and have the teams posting their weekly updates so that there's, there's a continuous uh, updating. Um, assignment descriptions, you need to be very clear and detailed about what you want them to do, including how to engage with the technologies that are appropriate to that particular assignment. If you can, this is not necessarily possible on a first run through of a course, but perhaps on further uh, iterations of the course, specify how long the activity should take so that they can have that in their mind and feel self-efficacious going forward. And, and so things like if you send them to a link to, to look at one page of a website, they might get it in their minds that they need to look at the whole website and they're, they're spending hours and hours doing this work that's unnecessary. So anticipate those kinds of things and, and help, help to avoid them. Um, the recommendation again is to start slow, start with, with, with a leaner course and lower cognitive burdens and then ramp up because you want them to experience success in this new setting before challenging them further. <clears throat> so establish a, a learning community, a lot of social presence up front, um, have a good course design, clear instructions, and a lot of facilitation as you're going along. It's a lot of work on the, on the part of the instructor. So some tips about um, effective online teaching before we get into our workshopping here. On course design, on the syllabus, starting up, communication, and facilitation. Course design. Have a clear chronological structure for the course. Use a standardized course format. Set office hours and keep them unplug. Very important for online teachers to be able to to do that, to unplug. Otherwise, if you're on notice 24-7, that's quite a burden. Um, this is a neat idea. The Ask the Class, Ask the Professor section on it. Have a special discussion forum that's for, you know, general questions about the class that are either to, to their classmates or to the professor, and that can be a general forum for the class. <clears throat> Chunk the material, again, uh, 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 a strong theme. The, so the, the three presences was a big theme and the chunking was a big theme throughout the uh, all kinds of presentations here. Um, so instead of a long video, several seven to ten minute videos with activities after each one. Um, scaffold small weekly assignments that build up to large assignments. And this is sound pedagogy anyway, face to face too, right? I mean, we do these kinds of things with, with, with our assignments. And you don't have to score each step, uh, each small bit of the, of the largest pro of, the, of the project as they're going along, just score it for completion. But, you, but, but it's an opportunity to coach and keep them on the right track and give them an opportunity to, to gradually build up to the large project you want from them and, and experience success. Um, include both readings and videos online, not only one or the other. Regarding the syllabus, some, some of the tips are make it very explicit, uh, probably more explicit than it, than it is in a face-to-face -face setting, 
and maybe like have a scavenger hunt, a fun activity to reinforce the syllabus. Chunk the syllabus again and present it at time of need in the module form online and translate the syllabus to a concept map. What are the overall, con and again, concept learning, concept-based learning, right, which is what our, our ADN program is moving toward. What are the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the territory of concepts that you're, that you're taking the student through in this learning experience? Give them that map along with the syllabus. In terms of starting up an online learning experience, have a synchronous first meeting, face-to-face -face first meeting if you can. If, if, you can, if you're not meeting face-to-face, -face, try to arrange a synchronous meeting. Maybe it's a video feed, um, but some kind of first synchronous meeting where everybody is together at the same time and you can establish social presence with each other. Um, facilitate introductions to the whole class when you start up from all the students to each other and from yourself. And here's a neat idea. On the first day, have the students rewrite the course outcomes. See how they understand them feeding back to you in their own words and then maybe post um, really clear uh, re re rephrasings and, and unclear rephrasings and establish a clear understanding of that going forward. Tips for communication. And again, that idea of the uh, casual video to present the, the instructor in a very human uh, manner um, using collaborative language. This is our course. I'm the facilitator. This is a shift to student-centered learning from teacher-centered learning. I'm the facilitator. And um, give them a sense of who you are as a person, what your life outside of class is like. So that's how great that, that example was of, of presenting the instructor to the students by way of the instructor's daughter talking about her mom. A very human um, presentation. Technologies that were mentioned that can help with this sort of thing, Jing, and voice thread. I know Professor Kallmeyer talks about Jing a lot. I haven't used it yet. But um, in terms of communication, issue weekly announcements. Have regular communication. Keep the feedback loops open. Um, and again, wrap ups: what we've done, what's coming, updates, lots of frequent updates and wrap ups, and so on. Summaries. In terms of, of ongoing facilitation of the course, some tips. Split the class into small groups with regular discussions. And I found with the course that I took as a student, it were, there were not groups, and there were like 30-some of us. So you know, each week there was a discussion board on a particular topic, and you know, it was, it was you know, 30 original postings to scour through, and then, and then responses. I was responsible for one original post and then three responses to my classmates. That way, with everybody lumped together, you know, I sort of got a feel for a few of my classmates, but I didn't get a, you know, a group feeling. If you separate them out into teams, you can get, even though, you know, it's exclusive, it's just a small group, but at least there is that feeling of community and a, and a deeper knowledge of each other. And, 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 and thinking can, can go deeper, I think, in that, in that setting. Um, so with discussions, look for quality, not quantity. And in facilitating, um, you know, if you've got a lot of students, all you can do is skim and, and just see where it's appropriate to intervene for encouragement, for coaching, redirecting. Um, and post an etiquette statement, and I think we're going to have um, a, a standardized etiquette statement that, that all of our online or Harvard courses we will use in our various programs. Don't allow problems to fester, um, deal, but deal with the, indi with the, with the, with the problem maker um, individually offline, or if you, if you deal with it um, online to everybody, don't specify the individual. Just say, hey folks, we need all of us. We need to you know, not flame at each other in our postings, whatever it is. I saw an example of that in my, my online course that I was taking as a student. Um, and, and the instructor, I think, did it well. And, and she chose to do it by addressing the whole class but making it anonymous. Um, so one of the disadvantages of online learning, for, for, for some of us at least, is, is we feel the lack of the nonverbal cues that we get from 
people in the, in the class. And, and so to mitigate that lack of nonverbal feedback, um, you know, you can't totally replace it, but some things you can do, chunk the readings and allow self-assessment. So that whereas, you know, a puzzled look on a student's face allows you in person to say, uh, you know, is that clear? Can I help you uh, understand this better? And, and allows them to, to ask a question, you to follow up and you, and you, and you clarify. Can't do that online, but, but you can give them the opportunity to do more self-assessments. So, you know, assessments, little quizzes that have feedback where that tells them that they have the answer right or wrong and what the rationale for the answer is, that sort of thing. Um, polls and surveys to get a sense of, of what they get and, and, and then you can respond with, with appropriate um, clarifications to the whole group. This was a neat idea, start, stop, continue. So an open forum that you can establish on the first day and periodically check into asking students, what am I doing that doesn't work for you that you want me to stop? What am I doing that would be helpful you want me to start? What should I continue that's working well? Stop, start, continue. And you can moderate that, so to avoid flaming and, you know, tone, set the appropriate tone. Um, <coughs> And then, you know, after after face to face, one one of the powers of the hybrid model is that you can engage them before they come to the in class session. You can also engage them as a follow up after the in class session online. Um, follow up quizzes at a higher cognitive level, perhaps. Okay, so some of the concepts um, that I, that I gleaned from this conference and some of the tips that came through. And so, um, you know, we can have a little chance to chat about some of that. What, what's your, what are your impressions? What feedback do you have? Questions, comments? And maybe we can do a little workshopping activity to see how we can apply some of these things. If, if we could maybe, do you want to break down into just all of us? It's a small group of people here. We can just sort of brainstorm uh, maybe just one or two things from everything that we talked about that we could that we could add to to our courses. You want to circle up a little bit just for a few minutes yeah, and do that. Do that. Anybody, anybody got something that they're, they're dying to to implement like the, and talk about? I like the forum question area. Having one area where students could ask like a public question. Yeah. Yeah. I liked also in the discussion forum topic. I liked. Uh, breaking up the discussion forum. I have a class of 22 students right now, and it is hard to sit through all of them. If they were broken into teams, that would be so much easier for them and me. I like that idea. I, I, I'm doing a, a hybrid uh, version of the uh, writing in the health sciences, and I have them broken out into teams, yeah. and I think it's working very well that yeah. way. How large are your teams? Um, uh, four or five. Okay, that's perfect, because same thing with my online course that I'm teaching now. I have between 33 and 35 students, and they're responding to each other, and I'm like, what? Yeah. yeah. It um, gets, the I, threads get lost, and, yeah. and they don't really get a yeah. sense of each other. Yeah, that's the way I feel, too, so I uh -huh. like that idea, too, once I figure out the technology. Yeah. <laughs> that's how to do that, but I think that sounds like a good plan. So then with, with the teams, you can, um, and you have the recorder and the moderator and the whatever, you could also have a position or the recorder who then posts to the big group so yeah. each, everybody gets the yeah. benefit of the yeah. individual group's right. synopsis, say. Right, 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 yeah. And then, and then um, I, I follow through with the teams when, when we meet face to face. For certain activities, I have them broken out into their teams and then, as appropriate, they can share to the whole group, too. But I'm hoping that by the end of the semester, there will be a strong feeling of collaborating and, and, and learning community. Uh, I just had the occasion when I, I gave an assignment back to them to reinforce that we're trying to build learning communities here. You guys need to be working together with each other. It's interesting. I, I am doing the flipped classroom approach for microbiology. So we meet a, a reduced time period, but it's every week. And everything that they're talking about doing online, we are doing in the classroom. We do have learning communities, four yeah. to five students. 
and they do engage when they come to class on identifying five key concepts from the material and then we all put our heads together at the very end as a mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. to see what is it that we're identifying as being strategically the most important immediately prior to their going online to take the exam. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing that in developing the, the thing that they really enjoy is the practice test taking looking at questions I also post mm -hmm. and I identify the length of videos. I have a fabulous speaker coming to speak to my microbiology class. The main infectious disease specialist on the planet is going to be lecturing to my class because he did it at Baker Institute and they're going to be listening and answering questions and then coming in to engage in discussion. Okay. That really excites now me. Now that, that raises a question. So. Do you have to get permission to use these he's things on YouTube. It's that you posted find on out YouTube. there? I'm not, I'm not asking anyone. He's on YouTube. I mean, I'm not taking anything from any private site. Hmm. Uh, and I would imagine it's, it's public information. Most of the, because he's talking about how to eliminate the neglected tropical diseases, and that's his passion, it's an important topic, and he's presenting results on that. I, I don't think that he would want it not shared. So it's, you know, it, it's that kind of opportunity to really bring his lecture from a few months ago to the class, something I can't do with a textbook. So I think, that, you know, those are those. I, are, huh? I, I don't know legally, but I, I think anything that's on YouTube is fair game, isn't it? There are, I think, um, <clears throat> guidelines like within Blackboard. So you can use it and show it in your classroom, but if you were to post that into Blackboard, there are some nuances about how links are posted and things like that, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if that pertains to YouTube or just other more private sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would th I would think not. I mean, it's certainly something we can check. But it's publicly available. It's so. publicly available. Yeah. I, I could yeah. just send them. I could give them the link, and I, just I thought to I thought as long as we write who it is, give credit for who it is, that it would be okay. You know that. Like cited like APA format or whatever. I would, I would think. Yeah. Maybe that pertains more to like PDFs, for example. You can't put PDF in Blackboard every semester. You have to link them instead to the article. Maybe mm -hmm. it pertains more to like uh, article. Mm -hmm. Oh, like you can't copy the article and make it a PDF. You have to link them. Just to if, it. if the article is out there, be, link them directly to the article. Yeah, to be a good workshop coming up. Yeah, that was and it will one. be. Yeah, <laughs> it, it would be a good workshop topic. And I think what another good workshop to topic would be what you suggested about uh, stratifying the, the difficulty yeah. of engagement. You know, from from core, from initial courses up through three and four hundred level courses. In terms of, I think that's something we haven't. You know. Yeah, once, be, once, we, get, once, we get our, once we get our programs first. and the curricula right. set out, I think right. that that would be very worthwhile looking into because we really want but even as we students get, to feel successful as right. they move through an online program. Because I know at, at, the, at the 100 level, like micro, I'm really trying to be very simple. I'm not anticipating them for myself, for my own learning curve. I can hardly call myself a professional yet. Though I'd like to be someday, but you know, I, I want to keep it comfortable for them to be able to engage so that it's not a handicap yeah. uh, as they're going to material that's already. Well, I think up. Megan, as part of your new role, congratulations. That I think there needs to be a course for faculty in teaching online and hybrid that gives us so that we number one that you can kind of like a self-paced thing so that um, you can kind of learn some of that. I don't even know, like you said, the terminology. So what are the 10 key words that I need to know to be able to start an introductory online course? Mm -hmm. well, you know, what are the key things, you know, when you talk about pushes out to their phones, and I was just reading something about that, like, that were not a whole course, but it's those kind of things that you were saying. I was just reading that, but I, honest to God, I don't, I don't even know how to Twitter. I don't know when Nathan posts these things. I'm getting <laughs> four and five of the same thing because he's. I don't know. Yeah, yeah there will be lots and lots of resources way. and professional development opportunities, and there will be lots of that. Yeah, because it's way over my head. Sounds good to me too. Plus, like I said, trying to 
I know that it really engaged my students in psych when I was putting my course together by using a bunch of YouTube videos and those short ones, like yeah. the short first, not the you know long forever ones, yeah. but they stuck in their head forever. A lot yeah. of them remembered a lot of stuff from the Hesse's too, um, because of the fact that they remembered that anorexic that was a model that died, you know, but then in, in the conversion disorder kids and stuff like that. But I definitely want to make sure that you know, it was all from YouTube, but I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm not mm -hmm. violating yeah. anything. But also, how, how do you identify reputable sites on YouTube? And right. how do you search YouTube? I don't know that. Many universities. I don't know that. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's, that's what right. I did. I did universities that's right. and then also like... Just like for our students, for us, we, we will need the exactly. instructions, the exactly. clear instructions. But it's true. It's true. It's true. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Thank Berger. You very My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, group. I love it.